Hey, welcome back to a new installment of the Wide Ride Podcast. I'm Manny Navarro, Miami Hurricanes writer and college football writer at The Athletic, joined, rejoined by a familiar face. Carlos Ledo of the MIA All Day Podcast is back with us. Carlos, <laughs> it is Wednesday, April 17th, around 1 p.m., which means it's two days after the end of uh, tax season. How does it feel? How do you feel? Yeah, after Terminator Judgment Day, it feels amazing it feels like a, a big weight has been lifted off my shoulders i feel very relieved you know it, mia all day is very appropriate i've been mia for the last couple months but i'm back <laughs> i'm back and uh you know although i filed like 100 extensions i've got to like october to do that i'm good i'm not worrying about it but i have people pressuring me trying to get their, their taxes done before the deadline uh, because you know people down here man they they aren't proactive they don't do things like ahead of time they want to come in and you know, day of with the deadline right there looming, drop a stack of papers in front of me and say, can you go through these bank statements and uh, file the taxes for my LLC? And I'm like, no, get your shit, get out of here, file an extension. <laughs> well, listen, we're happy to have you back. Uh, there were a lot of listeners of the Wide Ride Pod who were missing you, wondering what was going on. You, you confused them, telling them you were on suspension. You were not on suspension for the record. No, no, I was actually just uh, on a pilgrimage to Nanda Parbat. If anybody reads comics, they'll get that reference. <laughs> well, listen, we're happy to have you back. Miami's obviously done with their spring. I mentioned that it's April 17th, which means we're officially a day into the spring transfer portal window, which opened Tuesday, April 16th, and runs through April 30th. It was a busy day, first day. A lot of guys uh, jumping in the portal. I think uh, my colleagues at The Athletic reported that a year ago there were about 90 guys who got in the portal. I think this year it's almost double that on the first day. Uh, Miami had a few guys enter the transfer portal. Uh, Trevante Citizen, the running back, uh, who unfortunately had that terrible knee injury. Logan Sagapalu, the offensive lineman who transferred in from Oregon uh, and basically started one game for Mario in two years. And then, of course, the much-discussed uh, quarterback, Jakari Brown, uh, he entered his name into the transfer portal as well, joining Nigel Lee Kelly and Henry Parrish Jr. So five guys who started spring football with Miami are gone. There'll be a few more, Carlos, because Miami is right around 86, 87 scholarships right now with the 10 guys that they picked up, uh, or the 10 guys that they're going to be adding, rather, uh, in terms of freshmen here, um, you know, that, that are enrolling in the summertime. So still got to get under the 85 also, looking at some big-time targets, including this kid, Damian Martinez, uh, the running back from Oregon State. We're going to get into the transfer portal, discuss a whole lot of that, uh, Carlos. So we got a lot of, we're going to get your thoughts on all that kind of stuff. Yeah, man, uh, listen, I, I think the, the most interesting thing, it's not just because it's not just Miami's roster, but I think the transfer portal is leaving a gaping hole in everybody's roster across the country, kind of like the gimp left a gaping hole inside Marcellus Wallace in Pulp Fiction. <laughs> He's back, ladies and gentlemen. He's back. <laughs> Uh, our old friend Cormani McLean, uh, among the people who left uh, Colorado here and entered the transfer portal. We'll talk about him a little bit. We'll talk about who's doing well in the ACC, who's doing bad. Uh, I went to Orlando this past weekend, Carlos. Um, it was a long day for me. I drove up to Orlando early, uh, went to the Elite 11 regional camp, watched a whole bunch of um, 2026 quarterbacks that Miami's interested in. Uh, and recruiting, and they had a lot of good things to say about Shannon Dawson, believe it or not, the Miami, Miami's offensive coordinator. So we'll talk. Yeah, about, they must not know him very well. well. We'll we'll talk about those guys. We'll get to some mailback questions, but we are going to start with the spring game because Carlos, you made time to watch it. Uh, yeah. you, you you watched it uh, online. Uh, you had some thoughts. Uh, Cam Ward. Let's just start off with this. Cam Ward looks sensational to me. I think he had. I wrote he had five incompletions. Uh, uh, three touchdown passes, one to each of his, you know, projected starting receivers in Jacoby George, uh, Isaiah Horton, and Xavier Restrepo. And I thought the passing game looked great. I thought the DBs did not look great. Um, the running game really didn't splash. Uh, but you know, there, there's things Miami has to work on. But I do think, and I said this on on uh, on ACC PM yesterday when I went on ESPN's uh, ACC network. Oh, oh name dropping your uh, na national appearances. Name dropping my national appearances. I did say this. I said the nine and a half win total, I think, is very reachable for this team. And I think, I think, Carlos, there's a chance Miami could win the ACC this year. But what are your thoughts on the spring game? Let's go. Let's start with what you look took at, away. Look at this. You are hedging your bets as the true Florida State fan that you are. You're trying to pump it up so it doesn't seem like you're actually rooting against the Hurricanes down the stretch. Um, speaking of looks, listen, before I get it in the comments, yes, I haven't had, I haven't hit the just for men in a while. Yes. So I've got the I've got the Cuban Clooney look going on. So you and I, you and me both, brother. I got a lot of gray in here. Silver foxes till we die. Dad bodies for life. There That's you go. Right. Hashtag that. Sucker. <laughs> anyway. 
So yeah, Cam Ward, I think the the glaring thing to me about Cam Ward is his accuracy. I think not only does he have a good arm, uh, but I think he puts the ball where he wants it to be uh, nine out of 10 times. I didn't see an inaccurate throw from him uh, through the spring game. To me, the most impressive throws were the throws where he went across the hash on deep outs and the ball was on the money hitting receivers in stride. That's a hard ball to throw. It may be mm-hmm. one of the hardest balls in football to throw. Uh, and he was doing it, you know, regularly without without struggle. So that's that's nice to see. I think the other thing that stood out to me was the offensive line was underwhelming in in the scrimmage. Um, the running back struggled because I think the offensive line wasn't doing a good job of getting pushed up front. Right. And there were a lot of plays that I thought sacks could have been called on Cam Ward, uh, where the pocket broke down and he just just let them play. He'd be able to get through the scrimmage and get some offensive reps going. Right. But uh, I think the defensive line actually had more sacks than they gave credit for, or could have had. If it was fully live. Um, as far as quarterbacks are concerned, you know, I remember somebody coming on this pod and telling you, uh, or doing their own podcast, saying Reese Poffenbarger had some issues with mechanics and accuracy, and things yes. of that nature. Wonder who that was. Well, looked looked like that person was right. <laughs> um, also, uh, somebody also said once that uh, Jakari Brown's mechanics are inconsistent and his accuracy is inconsistent, and he's feast or famine, and you know, kind of showed that in the spring game. I guess guess who said that? Yeah. Suck it, guys. Anyway, so. <laughs> You know, to me, again, also, I talked about uh, Judd. I, I didn't think he was that great of a prospect coming out of high school. I thought he was okay. You know, again, he's a freshman. He might develop, but I don't think he looks all that great. Uh, I think the Hurricanes need to add a good quarterback. They're obviously going to add a quarterback uh, now with Luke Nickel in his coming class, which to me, I think is a legit quarterback. I think they need to add in that 26 class as well, get another stud, and actually create more competition there in the in the quarterback room once Cam Ward leaves. Um, but I'll, aside from that, you know, I think Isaiah Horton looked very good. Um, he made some plays. Uh, you know, obviously, Xavier Restrepo is receiver number one, wide receiver number one. There is a large gap to me between Restrepo and everybody else in terms of the receiver room, in terms of the way they looked in that scrimmage and the way he performed. To me, the most impressive play that Xavier Restrepo had in that scrimmage wasn't even a huge play. It was where he ran just a quick hitch route, Cam Ward threw him the football, and as he was moving towards the ball, he was already touching it and moving in a different direction opposite where the DP was coming in to make a play on him and was able to get another five yards out of it just because of his concentration on the football and movement at the same time, which is very difficult to do. That's a veteran receiver move. Um, so they're going to benefit a lot from Xavier Shreples, not only his talent, his ability, but his, his savvy as a receiver and as a player. Um, like you said, I think the DPs were mediocre. I didn't think they did well. Um, I think they left a lot of, a lot of guys open, a lot of guys running free, a lot of gaps in the zones when they did play zone. Um, that's concerning. I think the Miami has to add at least one, maybe two corners in the portal, maybe even a safety. Who knows? But I don't think, I think that that secondary is a concern right now. So we'll see how that develops in the, in the fall. You know, I agree. I think they could be nine and three. Um, the way they look, they're currently constructed nine and three. If they don't botch a game, uh, which they've been known to do here and there, they could be eight and four. Um, but I, I don't know that they're much better than that. Um, they could get lucky, maybe win a here, get a break, win a game here or there that they shouldn't win, um, or they, they pull out a win in a place uh, that's tough to, to win or a battle that they uh, normally would, would fold in. They come out with a victory and end up 10-2. and two. Uh, I don't see anything more than that, to be quite honest. But I think I think Mario's going to be hunting in the portal and shopping and adding guys where he needs to. And I think it, running back as well is a place where they need to add a guy after losing Henry Parrish. Well, I don't know if it's the orange Gatorade speaking to me, Carlos, or not. Um, but I, I watching that spring game, talking to people who have actually been out there, football people, I'm not talking about fans, mm-hmm. football people who analyze talent and rosters. Um, <clears throat> and somebody who told me Florida state was going to win the ACC last year, uh, and was right. And they went 13 and zero. and he told me Miami's going to win the ACC this year. I, I feel good about the offensive talent on this team in terms of wide receiver, uh, quarterback, offensive line, starting offensive line, maybe not necessarily the depth. Um, and I think that goes a long way in this conference. Um, you look at Florida State last year, uh, Jordan Travis, before he got hurt, was probably the best quarterback in the league, uh, most consistent guy. He had legitimate weapons around him, you know, uh, and Johnny Wilson, Keon Coleman, Jaheim Bell. He had a really good running back in Cedric uh, Benson. Um, or it's not Cedric Benson, but you know what I mean. Whatever. That was Benson. one hell of a running back for Texas back in the day. Yeah, yeah. The other Benson, Trey Benson. Um, they had a complete offense, and their offensive line 
I don't think was as good as Miami. And the Hurricanes were within seven points of that team. Um, this Miami team, I think, has a better player at quarterback than Jordan Travis and Cam Ward. Yes. I think they have the best, I'm going to make this argument, the best slot receiver in college football in Xavier Restrepo. If not the best, certainly top five. Top five, at least. Um, I think Isaiah Horton took a step up this spring from all accounts, from people that watched him all all spring and, and said to me, he's a legit outside guy. Um, and I think they're going to get Damian Martinez, who is a legitimate uh, number one running back ran for over 1100 yards last year in a very good Pac-12 conference. So, um, I think between those four guys and some of the young guys that they've added to this roster, like a JoJo Trader at wide receiver, like a Nike Har, um, with Jacoby George doing what he's supposed to do and not getting himself in trouble, that there is enough offensive talent on this team to score a lot of points and win this conference. Because I've also heard that Clemson is not doing as well as they hoped this offseason. They didn't they certainly didn't go into the transfer portal to get anybody. So they're relying on a lot of guys to grow up. The offense they're having some offensive line issues. Uh Louisville, it seems, could be losing a few guys to the portal because they're having some NIL issues. And then Florida State doesn't have that same wide receiver core or quarterback, even though I think DJ Uyongale is going to be a solid, you know, probably top three quarterback in the ACC this year. So um I think when I look at the conference as a whole, that's why I have that confidence. I also think Miami's defensive line, from from all accounts, from people I've spoken to that are football people, when Ruben Bain is healthy and Kiko uh, Maui Noah is at middle linebacker, and Akeem Mesador is back with the right wearing the right shoes, and Miami, you know, implements Elijah Alston and and throws in another couple pass rushers. C.J. Clark, I think, was a great pickup at D tackle. He's mm -hmm. the one who helped shut down the run in that spring game. I think their front seven is going to be very very good. Wesley Bassett yeah, took agree. some steps. So the only area that I'm worried about really is the secondary. And and I think they've got three guys that are reliable. I wouldn't say great. I would say reliable. I think Mish Powell, Damari Brown, and uh, Mr. Number Two. Uh, Daryl Porter Jr. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Daryl Porter Jr. I don't know. I was going to call him something else. And I'm like, it's not. that's not the name I'm thinking of. Daryl Porter Jr. I think those three guys are solid. I think they're going to get some guys in the portal here and solidify this thing. This is this is a team that's shaping up to be right now, as is, even with the, the, the guys who have left, I think one of the best teams in the ACC on paper. I'm confident saying that. Um, I just think <laughs> I just think Cam Ward uh, is the X factor. And he kind of, yeah. you know, he's kind of a bigger version of De'Aaron King with a better arm. You know, yeah, uh, he's not he's not as uh he's obviously not De'Aaron King with the wheels. I think De'Aaron King was at a different level running the football, but he's definitely and I think he's a better passer than De'Aaron. I mean, elusive, he's, like just yeah, being yeah, able to elusive. extend plays, extend plays, look down yeah. the field, make throws, all those things. Yeah, I think he he's, is. He's the best passer they've had here in a, in a while. Um, he, he's just got to be consistent with it, and I hope that happens in regular season. I don't see why not. He did it right. at Washington State, and I agree with you. On paper, they're they're a really good team. They're very talented, but they always are, right? Well, um there last year we went into the year with last, questions we did we still have questions and we thought they could have been eight and four nine and three last year mm -hmm. and they, they kind of shit the bed in a couple games so that's that's the thing they have to overcome to me the the question isn't the talent with De'Ari king and the weapons around him to me the question is how do they utilize those weapons right right because you can have all the talent in the world but if you're handcuffed if things don't go if you're not given the opportunity and the tools uh, and the resources to be able to exploit that talent and use it to the best of its ability, then it doesn't mean anything. Um, so we'll see how that goes. And I think to me, yeah, the, the biggest concern with the, the, the you know, the front seven is going to be great, I think. Like you said, the big concern is the secondary. That's a huge concern considering that most people in college football throw the ball a lot. But if you can get to the um, quarterback, if you can put pressure, if Ruben Bain is healthy and yes, guys like helps. Hakeem Mesador and, and C.J. Clark – and and you have a barrage of defensive linemen that you can throw at people, um, you're gonna look a lot better in pass coverage. And and personally, Carlos, you look at who they're playing. They're not playing great quarterback. Uh, what's his face is gone from North Carolina. Um, you know, I mean, Jordan Travis is gone at Florida State. I mean, there's guys that that have have played quarterback for a long time that have left this conference. Yeah, I would say they they arguably had a really good front seven last year and a better secondary than last year than they did this year, and they still struggled in games. Well, they didn't lose. They didn't lose because of defense last year. They lost. No, but they they had games where they gave up forty one to North Carolina. Uh, sure, they gave up twenty to NC State, which is not a lot, but I mean, they gave that up thirty eight to Louisville, 
31 to Rutgers. Um, you know, so I, I, my thing is, yes, listen, I'm a Hurricanes fan because I'm going to get that shit in the comments. Now I'm the Florida State fan. <laughs> no. All I'm saying is pump your brakes. I don't think this is a national championship team. ACC championship? I'm not saying awesome. national championship. No, no, I'm, I'm speaking to the fans at this point. Yes. I'm saying chill out. Let's see what happens in the fall. Right now, the way they're constructed, the way they look, I think they're 9-3. and three. Okay. That's fair. I mean, and, and and that's very well could happen. They got to play at Louisville. They got to have, they got to beat a Florida State team that still has beaten them, what, three years in a row? Mm-hmm. Um, They got to, you know, they have to go out in, in, in Florida in the first game of the season and prove that, hey, this is for real. This isn't a joke. Don't go to Florida and lose the first game because. And, and also paper doesn't count for injuries. Who knows what happens, right? Oh, like, right, right. Absolutely. So if Cam Ward goes down early in the season, this whole shit could tank. But as is, assuming everybody's going to be healthy the whole season, I think nine and three. Okay. I'll, I'll say this. Um, I, I think, you know, you, you look at the, 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 let's talk about the backup quarterback situation. Obviously Jakari Brown left and we're going to, we have a mailbag question. Where we'll, we'll address Jakari specifically. I think at this point, what we saw out of Poffenbarger and, and what other people who talked to me said they saw out of Poffenbarger was he could be a solid number two quarterback, but he's not a number one. And if Miami is really intent on red shirting Emory Williams this year and Cam Ward stays healthy, then fine. Then 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 Reese Poffenbarger can be your backup quarterback and Cam Ward starts every game and you do, and you can, you know, sprinkle in a little Poffenbarger here and there late in the game. But in the event something serious were to happen to Cam Ward, uh you have to go to Emory Williams and and yeah. and sorry about the red shirt, you know. Uh I think I think that's the bottom line. I think it's fair to think that way. I think running back Several people have now told me, and and again, at first, the initial things I was told was Mark Fletcher was going to be fine. Mario Cristobal came out and said he expects him back this summer. There's a reason Miami's looking hard at a running back, at, at somebody like Damian Martinez from Oregon State. Uh, the injuries that Mark Fletcher are coming back from, besides the foot, he's had other issues apparently, um, are, are, you know, put him in jeopardy where he could be banged up, maybe not a hundred percent for the season. And he's playing through injury uh, if he comes back and at the start of the year. So uh, then you have AJ Allen, you've got a, a couple of other young guys that you really, really like, but the point is you don't have a bell cow. If Mark Fletcher is not a hundred percent and ready to go. So Miami is looking for that guy. Uh, now what, what, what exactly is a bell cow? Now this is, and how does that differ from a cow without a bell? Like this is a reference of, that came out of the 1930s. The bell cow reference means a guy that can carry it twenty five to thirty times ah, in a game. Okay, okay. okay. So, so uh, then the backups reference. are like the cows. The cows without the bell. Right. The cow. The cow without the bell. Um, I, I am worried about the tight end position because Elijah Royo, for whatever reason, I, I don't know that the tight end position is going to be used much, if at all. I think they are going to be four wide. I think Elijah. You know, they, Mario can say what he wants to say, and and so can uh, the offensive coordinator. Uh, Shannon Dawson. Shannon Dawson and say, Hey, we're going to, you know, utilize the tight end, but you know, we didn't see it in the spring game. Elijah Royo had one pass on his way and it got knocked out by, by a freshman. So, um, we will see on that front, but I do like Elijah Lofton. I think he is a guy that's really, really exciting, uh, in terms of, to me, I, I said this to some, to another, to a scout. I said, this is Alonzo Highsmith, uh, in terms of body build, you know, Alonzo was such a big bodied guy. Some people thought he was going to come in and play defensive end, uh, or linebacker here at Miami ends up going to fullback. Uh, I think Elijah Lofton is sort of that fullback uh, that gets carries because he can actually run the football and be a power guy, especially on third and short and fourth and short, um, and and then catch a bunch of balls out of the backfield. Um, not that you're going to have a fullback back there, but in the event you go shotgun with two backs, uh, he can be a really dynamic weapon catching the ball out of the backfield. And I think we saw in the spring game, Cam Ward certainly feels comfortable flipping him the ball and letting him do his thing. Yeah, absolutely. And and again, it's it's a shame that they don't want to use the tight ends or they they have no plans to. But the whole four wide thing on a regular basis, I don't see that happening. Uh, Mario would not allow that. They want to run the football. Well, they'll, they'll line yeah. up with two tight ends when they want to run. Well, uh, then you're really giving away the game plan now, aren't you? Listen, they they, right. they, they, they don't seem to care much about that. Right? Well, that's fast. that's a problem. That's the whole problem with this offense. This is the shit that I've been saying from the beginning. Right. It's not offensive, it's not creative, and it's pretty predictable. And, I mean, you've got to be able to mix and use personnel groups 
in ways that confuses the defense and keeps them off balance. And if you're not able to do that, and one of the ways you do that is using the tight end in the passing game. Right. Um, if you're not able to do that and play action, do different things, then you're, you're going to be pretty stuck and stagnant on offense. And that could be one of the things that hinders you, regardless of the amount of talent you have on offense. Right. Well, um, I, I would say on the defensive side, some of the guys who who stood out were linebackers mostly, the freshman linebackers. Um, Popo Aguirre, I thought, had a pretty good camp. Most people told me they thought, you know, this is a guy maybe that's ready to replace Kiko Maui Goa when, when he's done after next season. Um, Wesley Besaint did have a good camp. Um, I think Cameron Pruitt is a really exciting player, another one of these freshmen. He's a, he's a converted safety kid they got out of Alabama. Um, I think he's a guy that, you know, you think strong side linebacker, old school strong side linebacker, somebody who can line up and cover the tight end and, and cover backs. Cam Pruitt has the speed to do that. So yeah, Darren Smith type. Absolutely. Yeah. I think he's going to be an interesting weapon to watch. Um, I mean, I like, I like a lot of the guys that they got. The Elijah Alston kid didn't play in the spring game. Um, but you know, he's a guy that's, that's a weapon that you're going to see rotating in there, sacking quarterbacks, you know, putting pressure there. Um, again, like, I think the defense is going to improve, but the question is, what do you do with that third cornerback spot? What do you do with those two starting safeties? And are those guys on the roster? Because Jadis Richard, um, big size, but everything I was told by scouts was he was a project. And Mario knew that when he got him. Um, Savion Riley, a little bit more production as far as tackling, uh, because that he did that at Vanderbilt. But again, he did it on a bad Vanderbilt team that won, what, two games, three games? I mean, he was kind of forced to play being the fourth leading tackler. So um, I think safety is a very interesting position um for Miami and and you know there's some interesting names out there there's a kid uh out of Texas A&M who who played a whole lot um for A&M in the past uh that that jumped into the portal yesterday um you know that's a name to to watch for Miami um but I still don't know that the guys that they really want have jumped into the portal yet and and we'll see if they do uh it's one of those uh one of those interesting games, Carlos, where <laughs> you're kind of, uh, you know, behind the scenes, you're trying to say, hey, are you going to jump in? Are you, are you going to be a little be wink, wink. Stuff, a little wink, wink, a little wink, wink stuff going on? So, um, so yeah, um, I think, you know, if they can get one of the, the guys that they really want to jump into the portal uh, at cornerback, they're going to pounce. So the one guy I would say who Miami fans should watch out for is the the Marshall kid who played cornerback. They, I think it's Diani Hall. Um who played for this coaching staff for Lance Gidry and, and Miami's new DBs coach. So uh, they do have, you know, some, some familiarity. The safety's name is Jacoby Matthews, by the way, I was looking it up here on my other screen. Uh, Matthews. Um, let's see here. 41 tackles, four pass, pass breakups and interception in 2021. He's from Louisiana. So we know Miami can recruit Louisiana kids. So that's the guy to look out for um, <clears throat> in terms of safeties. Um, what else, Carlos? Uh, our friend. Let's get. Let's talk about Cormani McLean, okay? Because right. Miami fans, Miami fans are buzzing about Cormani McLean. I think two four seven Sports reported today that uh, the former five star cornerback recruit is looking at U USC and USF. I, I, I think personally, he should go to USF um, and go play for Demarcus Van Dyke, who was his primary recruiter. And come back home. I don't know that he's West Coast material out there. Um, your thoughts on Cormani McLean? Would you give Cormani McLean a shot to come back in Miami? I mean, if he wants to come down, he can come down and compete for a job. That's up to him. Um, <laughs> but would I pay him to come down here? Hell no. <laughs> I wouldn't either. I think uh, I think we've seen what Cormani McLean is. Uh, he burned Miami on uh, National Signing Day two years ago, uh, and and I don't think. Um, I don't think Mario Cristobal has any interest in that whatsoever. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the guys in the ACC uh, in terms of that have entered the portal here in this spring window. I did the research, Carlos, of, of who's gone. And, and the two most interesting names so far are Pittsburgh, former Pittsburgh guys, uh, Dayon Hayes, a defensive end, and Solomon DeShields, who was a linebacker. These are starters. Uh, you think Pittsburgh was in the ACC championship game just a couple of years ago. Their coach is obviously having a hard time. And the and the most interesting thing was Dayon Hayes, the defensive end, actually did an interview where he said, and I quote, these were his words, I just don't believe we can win now. I believe we were going to win games, but I, leave, I believe we are in a developmental stage, and I just can't do that right now. Talking about going back to Pittsburgh. That's what he told the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Uh, 
as a guy who watches college football, when you hear one of the better players at a school like Pittsburgh say, uh, I got to go into the portal because I don't think we can win right now. What do you what are your thoughts on that and, and what it might mean for college football down the road? Well, I mean, I think it's it's more impressive to me that he wants to be part of a program that's winning or that has a chance to win his uh, his his goals, his motivation is to be successful in college football, right? To do the best he can, to be in the best possible mm-hmm. team he can. He feels maybe that his talent is going to be squandered on a team that's going to be developing. That's going to be a project that's not going to have the opportunity to be as successful and then uh, in turn not give him as much shine as he needs to maybe make the NFL. So it's better for him to do that than say he's leaving for money, right? He mm-hmm. could have left another mediocre program for NIL money, but he didn't. He's decided to go in the portal to look for an opportunity to earn a chance to get into the NFL, to earn a chance to win more games and maybe compete for conference or, or national title. So hats off to the kid, at least for doing it for reasons that are beyond just, you know, financial gain. Although, you know, obviously getting drafted is a little bit of financial incentive. Absolutely. Um, but I, I found it interesting and, and almost sad to just show people <clears throat> the state of what can happen to your program, right? In, in just a matter of years, like I said, Pittsburgh, won the ACC championship just a couple years ago. Uh, Wake Forest played in the ACC championship just a couple years ago. And these players, basically, you start to lose and your best players are going to just take off on you because they don't want to be a part of the losing. I think it's the first time we've really had a player come out and say that. Usually, I mean, Deion Hayes isn't some sort of superstar either, Carlos. I mean, there's a right. guy, 10 and a half tackles for loss, four sacks, four pass breakups, a forced fumble last season. He is from Pittsburgh. Like, he is a Pittsburgh native. And he's coming out and actually saying, I, I just don't want to be a part of the losing here. And I get it. Everybody has their reasons for getting in the portal, but this is the first time I've ever heard of a player actually coming out and saying, yeah, I don't even want to play for the hometown team because they suck. At least get to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> like, what do, you, what do you want him to say? Like, uh, honestly, it's it's one of those deals where, you know, no matter what he says, if he's leaving his hometown team, he's going to get shit on, right? And the people are going right. to get pissed off and they're going to be like, why are you leaving? You know, you're, you're abandoning us, this and that. And far too often, I think a lot of guys have made decisions because of the tug of home. Right. Uh, and stayed in bad situations because they felt some sort of loyalty to, to where they were from or where they grew up. And it's a detriment detriment to them in a lot of ways. So, you know, the kid's looking out for his best interest, man. He's doing what he feels he needs to do. It sucks to lose. It sucks to be in a place where you don't think you can develop and get the kind of shine you need to be able to take the next step in your career in life. You know, coaches do it all the time. If they see their rosters kind of down or if there's a better opportunity to win at a better program, they leave all the time. So right. nothing different here. I guess not. I guess it's just kind of disheartening. Like if you're a fan of some of these other lower tier programs and, and you know, our the columnists, uh, Ari Wasserman and Max Olson, our, so our national writers over at The Athletic, have written a lot about, you know, the transfer portal and what it what it's doing to college football. I've heard a lot of people, Carlos, I've talked to a lot of people who are like college football is being destroyed by this second transfer portal window. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I guess when I just look at the sport long term and I think, man, if a Pittsburgh area kid can can win a conference championship at their school a couple years earlier uh, and then decide as a senior, yeah, I'm not sticking around because we suck right now. Like, what is that going to mean? Are we are we just going to reach the point where it's almost like Major League Baseball? There's only a couple schools that really have any chance of surviving uh, every single year because in the end, the the, the best teams are just going to get the best players and and even the hometown kids aren't going to stick around to represent their hometown. Unless, unless you create a – culture and a program that could withstand ups and downs and that the players buy into, right? Like Wake Forest isn't recruiting blue chip guys on a regular basis anyway, right? They built their right. program on developing players and developing a program and getting the system rolling. So it takes them a couple of years, you know, after a down year to get back to it, but they get back to it. Uh, and, and most guys stay at Wake Forest, you know, they'll lose a star here or there like a Sam Hartman or other guys, but for the most part, they hang on to their players. So I think this puts the onus and the pressure on programs and coaches to establish a culture where they're not only recruiting guys, right, high school guys or guys from the portal, but they're recruiting their own players on a regular basis and creating an environment and a culture that lends itself to guys staying and wanting to see things through. If not, then you're just hiring a bunch of mercenaries if you don't have that culture established and that foundation established. So it's more pressure on the coaches. They got to do what they got to do, right? I mean, it's just like – it's been like this with, with college basketball for a long time because yeah. guys can leave after the freshman year. So you have to re-recruit those guys and convince them not to leave to the NBA, to stay in and keep playing. Just like, you know, Calipari had to do that. You know, Coach K had to do that. Other guys have had to fight that, you know, blue chipper leaving to the NBA thing for a while. 
and it's part of building your program and your culture. You've got to have that sort of presence and that sort of foundation. If not, you're going to be right. bleeding year in and year out. Yeah, it's just a state of college football now, I guess. Um, it is what it is, man. It is what it is, yeah. And and, and thankfully for Miami fans, uh, they've got a program that has a good NIL system. And despite going five and seven and seven and five, or five and seven and seven and six, I'm sorry, I forgot the Rutgers loss. Um, Don't forget that one. Fa fans still want to, I mean, players still want to come play for this program right now. And I think uh, that's why this year is such an important year. Carlos, talking about this season, we know Cam Ward is going to be the guy this year, but you and you kind of touched on it briefly a little while ago. Um, the future quarterback of the University of Miami. Um, who is that guy? Is he on the roster? We thought maybe at one point, maybe Jakari Brown could be that guy for this program. He left. Um, we've had Miami recruit four star guys in the past. They haven't panned out. Uh, Judd Anderson. I know you're not necessarily a big fan of here his, but he was Shannon Dawson's choice early on in the recruiting process in the 2024 cycle. Right now, Miami has a 2025 quarterback commitment. Um, a kid out of Georgia, um, Nickel. Luke Fickle, correct? Uh, Luke Nickel, 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 not Fickle, Luke Fickle, Stickle, Shickle, that guy. <laughs> Luke, Luke Nickel. I'm, I'm sorry, Miami fans. I know you're all probably pissed. How can you not know this? Um, Luke Nickel, who I actually watched play down here. Uh, his team came down from Georgia and played uh, Cooper City last year. I thought a lot of dinking and dunking, not a lot of deep throws on the field, but he's a guy that all scouts keep telling me over and over again is on the rise. Um, but the reason I bring up quarterback, Carlos, is because I went to uh, Orlando this past weekend to go to the Elite 11 camp. Um, and while the 2025 class here in the state of Florida is not uh, loaded, there's only two guys that are blue chippers. Uh, Carter Smith from South Fort Myers is going to Michigan. Uh, and Tronell Jones, uh, a kid out of the Jacksonville area, is going to Florida State. Those are the two blue chip quarterbacks in the state, and they're already committed. The 2026 class, though, Carlos, is loaded. And there are a lot of guys uh, that like Miami that are a part of this 2026 class. I'm going to read four names off to you because I, I watch these guys playing in, in person. One of them is Brady Hart. He's from Cocoa High School, uh, number nine quarterback in the in the class. Lake Mary's Noah Grubbs. He's number 10. Uh, Orlando Jones's Darian Coleman, who is number 21. And Sanford Seminoles, Michael Clayton, who's number 22. Of those four guys, uh, Hart. Grubbs and Clayton are all getting recruited by Miami. They've all had conversations with Miami's coaching staff. Uh, there are actually six blue chip quarterbacks in the state, including Roger Bell's son, Dia Bell, who's over at Plantation American Heritage. And then uh, Will Griffin, who is from Tampa Jesuit. Those are the six uh, blue chip quarterbacks in the 2026 class. Um, I guess I'm asking you this now. I'm bringing, now that I've gone full circle on the quarterback conversation, I'm asking you this now. Um, do you think... Going forward, Miami should, should just prioritize transfer quarterbacks, finding the next Cam Ward, or do you think they have to go back to trying to develop quarterbacks? Because obviously the last couple ones have not pan panned out. Tyler Van Dyke, yes, won the ACC Rookie of the Year, did not pan out, um, ended up leaving. Uh, Jakari Brown, here two years, did not pan out. He's gone. Uh, now you have Emery Williams, who may or may not pan out. Uh, you've got Judd Anderson, who you don't necessarily like. And and then, of course, we've got uh, Luke Nickel, uh, who's who's supposed to come into the 25 class. You still have Reese Poffenbarger also. Yeah, Reese, and Reese Poffenbarger, who was just a transfer uh, from, from Albany. I guess my, my question to you is, are you have you gotten past high school football recruiting with qu the quarterback position? Do you think at this point you just look for transfers? I don't think so. I think like with any position, you need to to use both resources. I, I think if you limit yourself to one area, you're not going to have a complete roster. Uh, if you focus just on transfer quarterbacks, you're you're only you're sort of at the mercy of whatever's available that year. And maybe you what's out there that year that you need a quarterback is just not good, right? And you're not mm -hmm. going to be able to find something that's going to be what you need to be able to be success to be successful. And I think ultimately, like with every position, competition is key. The more guys you have that are talented that can push each other to be the best they can be, the better it is for you. And if you have a balance, what you really want in the quarterback room is a balance between classes. So you want some older guys to help the younger guys develop, and you want that competition to feed up as you go along. Um, and that way you're not forcing a freshman into action right away. You're allowing that guy to develop, sit a year maybe, learn the offense, learn the system, learn from the older guy, get to know how they should prepare and go into a game and see things before they jump into action. So to me, I think you need both. Um, eventually, if, you, if you're recruiting – 
well enough and you're developing quarterbacks well enough, then you've got that through the high school recruiting. And maybe you have a hole here and there. Maybe you miss on one guy, you fill in it in with a transfer portal guy. So that's the way I think they're, they're going to be looking at it. They should look at it. Um, to me, I, you know, I think Emory Williams has some ability. He has some really good things about him. You know, it still remains to be seen whether or not he could be the next guy. I don't think it's Reese Poffenbarger. Uh, I don't think it's Judd Anderson. Um, I think maybe Luke Nickel could be another guy. They, they, could, they could be a really good quarterback. But we'll see. I think they really need to hit on the 26 class and maybe hit a, on the transfer portal at the end of the season. Well, I had a long conversation with the guy uh, who actually trains a lot of these quarterbacks up in the Orlando uh, area. His name's Balin Trujillo. He's uh, very active on Twitter. Uh, he promotes these kids. He Balin played for the Orlando Predators, uh, played collegiately at USF and Weber International. Um, and, and I got to tell you, he's a good salesman. He sits there. He t- he'll talk to you about every one of these guys, what he's doing with them, how he's, how he's sort of coaching them up. And, and something interesting that he said to me was um, a lot of these quarterbacks now, we used to think, well, you better have a really good junior year, right? So you can um, commit uh, right before your senior year starts. He's trying to get all of these quarterbacks to commit before their junior year starts because, in his opinion, every college program now has moved on to recruiting one transfer quarterback and one high school quarterback every single cycle because, in the end, the belief is they'll have your starter, you may have your quarterback of quote unquote quarterback of the future that you just recruited in the, in the previous class. And then you need two more, right? You need two more scholarship guys. So what happens is you try to lock in your, your future quarterback and you leave space for one, for one transfer. And and ultimately he doesn't want his guys to get left out of it. But I, it's absolutely crazy to me now that, that guys like Noah Grubbs who threw 49 touchdown passes last year in a high school season, Carlos, 49 touchdown passes. Uh, and, and I think he played 12 games. Uh, he is a kid that has started as a freshman and sophomore in high school. He's going to be committing uh, this July and 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 trying to stay locked in with one program so that he can recruit for two years and sort of go through the whole process. So if you want to read about that, if you want to read that article, it's up on The Athletic today. I just posted it uh, earlier this afternoon or earlier this morning. My editor did. Uh, if you want to read what uh, Trujillo and what some of those quarterbacks had to say, I will say this. Larry Bluestein told me he thinks Noah Grubbs – uh, I asked him, I said, do you have a comparison? And he said, Joe, Joe Burrow. Uh, that's, that's, that's a pretty good one. Um, Although I, think, I like Michael Clayton better. Not because I know what he's done, but just the name. He's the name, uh, right. It reminds me of the a, movie. He's a fixer. He's a fixer. He's like well, his. all of these guys are tall. Uh, the, the three guys that are interested in, in Miami, Darion Coleman, I think is, is pretty close to getting locked in with Oklahoma. Uh, he's super athletic quarterback and throw it 73 yards on the field. He's only six feet. 170 pounds right now, but his dad is 6'2", his mom is 5'9", and, you know, they're expecting him to grow. He's got size 12 uh, shoes that he wears, so they're they're expecting more growth. And then the other guys are all 6'4", 6'5", you know, 190 pounds and with rocket arms, Carlos. So it's a really good year for quarterbacks in 2026. So if you want to read about those guys, I wrote an article last year about Diabell. Miami's recruited Diabell, um, you know, the, the kid out of the Tampa area, Greer. Uh, those are the six blue chip quarterbacks in 26 class. And just know that they will be committing earlier than, than, than maybe we're used to. It'd be great if they could land two guys in the 26 class and get a transfer guy at the end of the year. I, I think they have to look at transfer to start next year. Somebody has to come in and compete with Emory Williams, Absolutely. in my opinion. They have to, you know, so again, this is part of the reason why it's such a huge year for Cam Ward at the quarterback position. All right, Cardo. So we've talked about my Elite 11 trip. We've talked about Cormani McLean briefly, the spring transfer portal, and we got your thoughts on the spring game. Let's dive into our mailbag. That's what All our right, fans here like. We go. That's let's, what our fans right enjoy. Here. Carlos, they, they love it when they get to hear you opine on everything that is uh, on their mind. So I'm going to go here to the first conversation. And the first question coming in from Scary Rombus. Remember Scary Rombus? Uh, no, but it reminds me of geometry class, and I hated geometry in school. I keep hearing that Mario is going after starter-level guys in the portal as opposed to the jags he usually gets. How does this become public? Is it a message he wants out there? Why? <laughs> How does this become public? Well, certainly Mario, uh, between people in his recruiting department and you know the people who talk to reporters – uh, yes, they want it out there. They want people to know that Miami is looking for help. And Mario said it himself when he did interviews. He talked about wanting to go out and get guys in the transfer portal. It's the it's the day and age of of, of the way things are. Yeah, you've got to let, listen. You've <laughs> got to let people know that you're open for business, right? He's he's got a grocery list. He's got to let Publix know, hey, this is what I want. 
I'm coming in there. I'm using Instacart, Insta Insta Portal. Help me out here. All right. This is from Tony Perez, Big Chilean 63. In the end, why wasn't Ja'Curry Brown good enough to be the backup? The other two non-starting QBs didn't look that impressive in the spring game. Um, I think the problem with Ja'Curry is consistency. He just yep. There were moments, as you said, Carlos, where he flashed. He made a really good throw, a really good play. Uh, but then there were moments where he would throw a six yard out and miss the running back by three yards and the ball would yep. fall flat. Uh, his footwork wasn't good, Carlos. Um, are you sad to see Jakari Brown go? Do you think he could have ever flourished here at Miami? Uh, I think it would have been great to see him get consistent coaching at the quarterback position to help him with his mechanics, because I think that was his biggest flaw. I think when you see inconsistency and in throws like that from guys, like you're talking about with footwork and things of that nature, it's a mechanical issue. It's not an ability issue. Right. And this, he was going into his third year. This wasn't a kid that was a, a freshman, right? Coming right. into his second year. This was his third year that he was coming into. At this point, you would have expected it to see some develop in the, development in that area. And it just wasn't there. I think the kid's got a boatload of talent. I hope he goes somewhere where they can develop him and use him right. Maybe it's, it's not the right system for him as well. But who knows? I think, like you said, the inconsistency to me with the accuracy, the mechanics, the feast or famine, he's either making a big play or making a bad play. It's not really enough. Um, you know, I'd rather a guy that can get me six, seven, eight, nine, ten yards on a consistent basis in and out, as opposed to a guy that can give me a 40 yard play and they give me negative 15 or a fumble or an interception on the other side. Yeah. Um, all right. This is uh, from Rampage Kane, Ron Mexico, 718. Did Zion Nelson play in the scrimmage? I, If he did, I didn't notice him, and I'll be honest with you, Carlos. I walked away after halftime when they stopped tackling, and the and the scrubs basically got in. I went to the tent, to the media tent, and I watched the game on TV and on the jumbotron screen there on campus. You started. Um, Nelson did dress out, Carlos. He did dress out, but I didn't think he was wearing knee pads. Like he put on the stuff, he put on the uniform, he went through a lot of the warm ups, but I physically didn't see him enter the game, and I don't know that anybody else noted that he actually got into the game. Sad to see, man. The kid went from, uh, you know, a great story coming in, starting as a freshman, being a uh, potential first round pick at left tackle to now not even getting on the field. So, you know, all the best to him. All right. This is from Nick Strong, KYK 23. I haven't seen or heard anything about it yet, but do you think college football will follow the NFL with their new kickoff rules? Yeah, I think everything that the NFL does, ultimately college uh, will, will probably try and implement. And if you're unfamiliar, the NFL now, Carlos, is basically taking from the XFL, which is uh, in terms of the kickoff where I think, uh, you know, guys line up, I think, on the 35, if I'm not mistaken, and, and the mm -hmm. kicker kicks the ball and then they're not allowed to start running or coming in until a certain point. It, it's to avoid injuries, to not have guys coming down the field full speed, uh, but to still be able to do the kickoff. So, I think for now, uh, college is content with the way the rules have changed. Where basically every ball goes into the end zone, you get it to twenty-five. But uh, I, I would expect college football will do it eventually. I, they they always sort of seem to copy each other because they want it to be uniform. Yeah, and I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point the NFL and college football just go away from even doing kickoffs at all. Just go, hey, everybody starts at the twenty and twenty-five yard line. Here's the ball. Let's go. Right. All right. This is from our buddy uh, Larry Shender, Miami Media Associates. Who would you rather have at running back? Uh, the kid from Oregon State, Damian Martinez, or North Carolina's O'Marion Hampton? Carlos, I just finished doing the All-State team. I, I've been doing this. I don't know if you – I know you've been buried in taxes, but uh, I've been doing these All-State teams for the modern recruiting era for the state of North Carolina. And O'Marion Hampton I – put, I put the two running backs for the state of North Carolina, uh, O'Marion Hampton – and um, Bryce Love, who played at Stanford. Both of them graduated from North Carolina high schools. And I've gotten nothing but shit for not putting Todd Gurley <laughs> Whoa. on the team at running back. And I guess my explanation, and, and this is the thing, I want to just get this clear for, for anybody who tunes in. These all-state recruiting teams isn't based on what guys do as professionals. It's based on what they do in college. And so Marion Hampton's 1,500-yard season last year at North Carolina was better than Todd Gurley, who had one 1,300-yard season and two 900-yard seasons at Georgia. By the way, Todd Gurley did not make an All-American team. Marion Hampton did, and he was a finalist for the Doak Walker Award. Todd Gurley was not. So that's why I did that. But getting back to the question here from our buddy Larry Schender, um, who do you take, Damian Martinez or Marion Hampton? Who do you think is the better back? I'd honestly be fine with both, but I think Omarion Hampton's a stud, man. I think that guy can really play. He's uh, You saw him against Miami. You saw him. I've seen him 
the last couple of years, he can really run the football. Uh, dynamic guy. He's got power. He's got speed. And you just said it, 1,500 yards last year. That's a lot of production. Yeah, he was good. Um, there's no question. I, I, I think they're both solid guys. Uh, Damian Martinez and Amari and Hampton are both number ones. They're a little different in their style um, yeah. physically. But I, I think Damian Martinez, he's the one available. He's the one that Miami, I think, is really in on and has a, probably a great shot to land. I'd be happy with Damian Martinez. Yeah, I'd be happy, happy with either one. All right. This is from Von Kane, your buddy. I think he's trying to incite you here, Carlos, to maybe get He always is. He's, he's a gaslighter, but that's fine. All right. All right. Uh, I've heard Air Raid multiple times this spring, but every year we hear about how they will spread it out. But Mario has given us this head fake every year with the chatter about Martinez. Damian Martinez, I'm just not buying it. Okay, no real question here, but interested in your thoughts. He goes, when they cite air raid principles, it just means 80% of the passes are wide receiver screens. Mario always has been a ball control guy, and that won't change. Outside of game management, his biggest coaching flaw is he forces players into his system instead of leveraging their strengths. Carlos, the floor is yours. Wow, listen, first of all, Von Kane, thank you for uh, basically listening to me and, and coming to my school of Shannon Dawson education. Uh, and Mario Cristobal education as, as I've tried to give you guys all classes over the last year or so. Um, yeah, I, yeah, he's right. And to me, the only the only semblance of air raid that we've seen is the mesh pass out of this team over the last year or so with Shannon Dawson. I, I don't think there's there's a lot of air raid traditional stuff that you see in terms of the passing game. Um, I think their lack of use of the RPO and play action to me is concerning, although they did it here in the spring game a little bit. Um, but it's got to be more consistent in terms of the way they use that to, to good effect. I think at the end of the day, like I said, um, they need to use personnel groupings. They need to use to, the formations, motions, shifts, things to confuse and, and, and create stress on the defense uh, and not be so stagnant. I think you see a lot of double wing out of this team, two tight end double wing. I think you see a lot of two tight ends on one side of the field, one inline, one offline, uh, a lot of inside zone, a lot of the same concepts and not presented or packaged differently. And I think the issue to me is that there's no versatility. There's no sort of counters to that. Shannon Dawson usually comes in with a solid game plan. And then eventually as the game wears on, he has no counters for when the defense adjusts to him. And that's when they lock up, go double wing, and Mario says, hammer the football, because that's our answer to everything. We got to see if they got better answers this year. You heard it. He gave you what you wanted. All right. This is from Andrew V underscore 17. Have you heard about any big time players entering the transfer portal from other schools? Do you think there will there will be any surprise players from Miami leaving? Well, Andrew, um, look, the big time players, if you if you want to check out the, the athletic does a great job. They've got a, a transfer portal tracker. I added, you know, the, the the stuff that I've known and been able to pick up on the hurricanes into that transfer portal tracker. Uh, we've got a lot of national writers covering, you know, who the, who the best players are. It's hard, Carlos, because there's a lot of guys that people have heard of before that were recruits, right, that did good jobs as recruits, but didn't necessarily pan out when they got to college, and they're back in the transfer portal now. So if you want to know who actually produces, who's actually done something and entered the portal, uh, The Athletic is tracking those guys and 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 writing about those guys who have who, who are actually good. So if you want a good and the bad, go check it out there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tease you there. But if I, do I think any surprise players could be leaving Miami? Yes, I think there's certainly that possibility. I think I look at a guy like Samson Okunlola, okay, the five-star offensive tackle, who got the start in the spring game at right tackle for Miami. Um, while Samson is certainly somebody who I think is in the plans for Miami, Francis uh, Marigo is coming back for the fall, and there's only one real open position on the offensive line. And I think Samson Okunlola, being a former five-star recruit, is probably getting phone calls, or his coach is getting phone calls from other schools who are saying, man, Samson, you could come over here and be our starting left tackle, right? So what do am I saying Samson Okunlola is leaving? No. Am I saying I would be surprised if he left? No, because those are the type of players that get picked off of your team, right? Like those kind of talented players. He's a second year guy coming back from injury. He's clearly somebody Miami likes a lot. They had him start the spring game, but is he guaranteed a starting spot? No. Uh, I think there's other guys like that on this team. Um, Damari Brown, right? His, he's a second-year player. His brother just transferred to Florida State. I'm pretty sure Florida State is trying to convince him to still go up there and to transfer and to leave Miami and to go and, and join their program. Um, so that is going to continue. There will be 
you know, sort of prodding of players to try to get them to get up and leave. And so would I be surprised? No, this is the new world of college football. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's going to be a few names that we don't expect to hit the portal at Duke. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if Reese Possum Poffenbarger decides to leave, uh, to go start somewhere else because he sees that maybe he can't, uh, isn't in the plans long term here and doesn't want to waste time sitting on the bench, right? He's coming from a program where he was a starter for a couple of years and he doesn't, he, he's cool with sitting for a year behind Cam Ward, but if it doesn't seem like long term, he's going to have a shot, then maybe he decides to go, um, after the way things shook out this spring. You know, who knows what, what could end up happening here down the stretch with guys. Maybe Jacoby George feels like he's being disrespected here, like he's had run into trouble a couple of times. There's better opportunities somewhere else for him to get the football, uh, maybe get some NIL money at the same time. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying those are scenarios that are possible, right? Right. This is from Michael Bonasar, M Bones 12. Which transfer who is leaving uh, from this window or the previous window is going to have the biggest impact wherever they end up. Well, I'm glad you said the previous window because I'm going to I'm going to take a peek here at my notes. I've got charts. You know me, Carlos. I've got charts yeah. for every power five team. OK, who left, who came in? Um, look, Tyler Van Dyke, uh, from what I was told, was in a battle for the starting job at Wisconsin. OK, uh, wasn't necessarily performing well. Uh, Don Chaney Jr. Um, I know Penny Boone, the running back who transferred into Louisville, left. Or so Don Chaney Jr. could potentially be the guy over there. I haven't followed Louisville enough to know, but I, you know, I did see that Boone left Louisville, so maybe that means Don Chaney is in in a big time position. Colby Young, uh, Georgia, uh, you know, they needed a big outside receiver. They spent money to come get Colby Young from Miami. He could potentially be a big time player for for Georgia this coming season. Um, you know, the rest of them. Jafari Harvey, SMU, he'll be a guy that's in the rotation. Uh, Corey Flagg at Missouri, he'll he'll be a guy in the rotation. I heard Devontae Brown was doing good at Florida State at safety, not corner, at safety where he's he's probably more equipped to 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 contribute. So, um, in the end, is there one guy? Maybe Don Chaney Jr. But I haven't been following Louisville, and I don't know what the exact running back situation. But I, I think if he's healthy, Don Chaney Jr. could be a good player for Louisville. Yeah, absolutely. He showed it down here in Miami. He was starting to roll down here and. Uh... Maybe he gets the opportunity to shine there at Louisville. I think he's got a lot of talent and a lot of ability. If he stays healthy, he should be a hell of a player. Right. And and I would say Colby Young would be the other one. Yeah. Um, Tua Believer says, and this is Ginger Man Cannon did, uh, with what kids allegedly make in NIL, is there a way to circumvent worrying if you have 85 scholarship players just to pay them enough to cover their expenses? Might be tough with out-of-state private co schools, but NCAA is always known to find loopholes. Yes, I agree. Uh, I think that's really what's been happening at SEC schools for decades. Uh, guys that end up becoming walk-ons there probably get a lot of financial aid under the table. Um, and now that you can – or ha did get a lot of financial aid under the table, and now – um, that you have NIL, um, they can certainly make up for some of those expenses and be quote unquote walk ons. I think that's certainly what's going to happen at, at, at schools that have the money that can afford it. Yeah, I agree. All right. This is from uh, Spurgeon Cigar. Is there any pickup in the portal which makes the, makes the college football playoff seemingly inevitable for the Canes? Well, I think if Miami were to get a legitimate number one running back and a legitimate number one wide receiver to pair with Cam Ward. Look, how, look how Washington made the national championship game last year. Right. I mean, they had Romeo Dunze um, and a bunch of really good receivers with Michael Penix and they scored a bunch of points. I think they need a number one corner. Uh, I think they need another safety opposite Mish Powell. Um, yeah. If they get that number one running back, that's a legit number one running back in addition to what they have and maybe another receiver, you know, yes, then I think they can make the college football playoff. But I think they need at least two DBs uh, to go along with those guys on offense. All right. Carlos, that's it. Our show's over. We've we've reached the end. Is there anything else you want to add that yeah, maybe uh, is, is imperative to tell the fans who missed you so much? Listen, I'm back. Don't fret. We'll be here on a regular basis, all right? Uh, if you've got any other questions, anything you want me to answer, anything you want me to do on my own podcast, I'll have some time to actually do one. I dropped one not too long ago from the parking lot of my daughter's Taekwondo studio. Uh, maybe doing some more of that stuff coming up soon. You know, hit me up, MIA level on Twitter or X or whatever the hell it's called nowadays. I don't care. It's still Joe Robbie to me. Are you still doing the uh, shirts, Carlos? Yes, absolutely. If anybody wants any shirts, hit me up. I've uh, released some designs online on Twitter, uh, X again. If you guys want uh, anything specific, let me know. Well, thanks for tuning in to this week's Wide Ride podcast. I am going to have um, 
a couple of other people on. Uh, I want to get some some Gators writers and from some Seminoles writers so of that we can do, do a uh, a little bit of uh, previewing those big matchups this year, Carlos. I want to know what's going on with those teams because we got to do our homework, man. We can't just rely on, hey, this is the Gators suck or the Seminoles suck. You've that, got as, you've got to get inside information player. on your team if you want to know how they're doing. You know, it's this this whole Hurricanes beat t- takes you away from uh, following your favorite school. So, I mean, what are you going to do? I get it. <laughs> Oh, man, I love having you back on the show. That's going to wrap it up for this week's Wide Right. For Carlos Ledo of the MIA All Day Pod, I'm Manny Navarro. We will talk to you guys soon. Peace.